two, one. And we are live in a prize month in review. I got Brian Summer. How you doing, Brian? Doing just fine, John. Just fine. This is our last show of the year, our last blowout. And we can't dilly around too much because we got Meg freaking Bear coming on in about 15 minutes. So you and I got to make quick work of our articles. Welcome everyone. Hey, by the way, is anyone here from the CRM Players Show? Because you're you get the uh, if you're here, post in the chat because you get the special online Enterprise Show Marathon badge of honor for going to two consecutive live streams. So just if you're in there, just comment. You get the special. I, we don't have a door prize, but you get a special shout out for doing doing the twofer. Yeah, that's the uh, Office Productivity Award of the Year, uh, you know, for catching two podcasts in a row. No doubt. Uh, no doubt. That's the the Hell With My Email Inbox Award winner. <laughs> so uh, you all probably know the drill by now, but we actually uh, have we have some visuals for you, which Brian has created. But we're basically going to walk you through what we think are, are the most underrated stories of of the month we can't promise you an ai free conversation but i can tell you that we got other things on our mind besides ai and we're actually going to ask meg if she has ai fatigue i'm curious if she does and i don't know if meg's on right now if she's backstage but whether she is or not i actually put a hr filter uh in meg's honor when i was looking at some of the underrated stories so um, yeah, you know, we'll find out if uh, she has anything she wants to contribute. So there are the slides. Uh, all yeah, right, dude. Yeah, we're we're decked up. I'm not sure what the meaning of the number scheme is exactly here, but uh, uh, well, we'll, that was, we'll run with it. That was in the that was in the template that PowerPoint provided. Uh, that's oh, all there I is see. to it. <laughs> okay, got it. Perfect. Okay, so uh, so Brian, we're going to start with your top underrated story here. Oh, wait, we got an agenda. This is the agenda. Oh, we got to do cringy buzzwords. Sorry, I forgot. So, Brian, you and I do the annual unpredictions. And yep. as part of that, we include the tech buzzwords that you should watch out for. And you and I picked a, a few keepers from that. Yeah, uh, there was a, there's always the uh, buzzword generator. That's kind of in the background there a little bit. But... Um, uh, two of them that I thought really were resonating, judging by some of the comments in LinkedIn and Twitter, were crap, crap form, which is a um, a technology or software platform that isn't worth shit, basically. And then there was, of course, everybody's got to be, you know, has to have resilient solutions, resilient workforces, resilient processes. And we've heard so much resilience uh, through the pandemic and afterwards that now it's devolved into resiliousness. John, what are your two out of uh, the unpredictions? Well, you know, I had to narrow, I had to narrow down some keepers there. Uh, I went with Data Outhouse which of course is an extension that many companies need from their so-called data lake house environment or data warehouse, et cetera. Uh, the, the outhouse is actually uh, a place that is a little bit inaccessible. It's typically dank. It holds crucially important data that's not in the corporate data lake. Uh, unfortunately, it's data that the AI needs to produce a halfway decent result. So that's a little bit problematic. And then I had to choose between my other favorites, which were hydromatic automation, and but I went with Leadership 404. When a corporation takes down their board member web page until they can actually field a diverse executive team, ouch. You know, that's uh, that's par for the course for you. You love leadership and, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm pleased to see you got that one in there. Um, all right, well, and of course, uh, you know, it wouldn't be even our unpredictions deal unless somebody got thanked for their leadership. And I know Meg has thanked people for their, their leadership over the years. So we'll have to see who she's thanking uh, when we get her up here in a few minutes. Well, that's it. Uh, you know, there's, there are other cringy buzzwords out there. We kind of focused on some of the ones we used for the unpredictions list, but there'll be a whole bunch more. And we'll talk some more at subsequent, uh, you know, podcast. But there never seems to be a shortage of them. 
John, what's our next uh, next part here? Is this the article review now? Yeah, I'm just checking because I've got a weird, I've got a weird um, Streamyard glitch where I'm not seeing the uh, the live the live comments um, stream through. Uh, but I got to check them on LinkedIn because it's kind of weird that it's not showing up here. Uh, comment technical glitch. Okay. So give me one quick sec. I just have to fix something here. while he's playing with the technology. I do want to publicly thank all the people that actually send us uh, periodically. We get some suggestions for the unpredictions every year. Um, believe it or not, I keep a running list of stuff all year long uh, that probably 70% of it doesn't make it into the final copy. And I'm sure a bunch of you would, You'd probably get a real hoot if you got to watch the editing process on that. That's one of those rare kind of collaborative uh, deals that um, uh, the development of which is even more fun than sometimes what ends up getting published. But uh, anyway, my thanks to everybody on that. So, John, do you have any luck? Uh, yeah, I think we're okay. I'm just not going to be able to bring the comments into the broadcast just yet unless it clears. But we did hear from Ruben who says... Good to see and hear you, Brian. Uh, mm. Don't have the last name quite on that comment. Sorry. And then Chris Payne loves crap form, by the way. So, <laughs> all right. So, moving on now, uh, we're going to move into our underrated stories segment. Yeah, I think I have the first couple of them. What's our next slide look like, John? Oh, <laughs> uh, we got the comments coming in now, Greg. The winner of discontent. We welcome the summer bear. <laughs> that, you know, I I love that one, Greg, because it's got a little twist of climate change for the wind too. So that's 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 beautiful. That that works humor on many levels there. Brian, what are your top? All right. Stories? So this one's uh, not your traditional media, uh, and John always busts my chops because I tend to pull a lot of stories from uh, stayed publications like uh, McKinsey Quarterly or uh, at the MIT Sloan Business Review and things like that. This is out of social media. And there's a great HR analyst, Sarah White, and she put this multi-piece thread out on, um, I believe that's Twitter. And if you can't read it, the essence of it was she was asked by a client of theirs if they would... Um, if she would apply for a VP job, and this is all really part of a test to see if their in-house recruiters would flag her through for at least a screening interview. And it turned out that the in-house recruiters not only didn't even bother to give her a screening interview, but they uh, didn't invite any of these eight other people that were very qualified for the position, but were kicked out. And as you read through the thread, you realize that they're not getting people aren't getting invited if they work as contractors or uh, whatever 1099s or they've had um, you know they they do a number of different kinds of assignments the recruiters intentionally kick them out um, and they do so because they actually believe they know more about what makes a successful person coming in than a an operations or hiring manager does in their own company. That's an eye popping read and could also explain, you know, I know I never get any traction from, you know, uh, recruiters and go ahead, write your own punchline on why that is. But, um, uh, but the bottom line is it's, it's a fascinating look at this tension between um, operation and line management versus recruiters and whose opinion reigns supreme about attracting quality talent? Frankly, I don't think you can win the war for talent with the attitudes that uh, Sarah's client surfaced up in this in this thread. Any comment, John? Uh, you were a recruiter. I, yeah, well, it, it boggles the mind to see that the profession has made so little progress since since I did it in the 90s. But I, I have a comment, but I want to get to your next story because I think it fits in better there. Okay. 
What is well being washing, Brian? Well, you know, I love all these new words that uh, are terms that come up in the HR world. You know, we've got uh, quiet quitting, quiet hiring. Uh, there was the, um, uh, I had a whole slide full of them that we used uh, and a whole bunch of them we used actually in the unpredictions. But this one was a relatively new one for me to see. But this, you can see on the top right here, the slide, well-being washing is a um, it's a term to describe how employers are going to present things like, oh, look at all the things we have. We've got like a ping pong table and we'll provide mental, you know, EAP kinds of programs for people. They do all these things that sound great that they're going to be, you know, help people and manage their personal professional balance and their mental health. But then they turn right around and go, oh, but because you're exempt, we're now going to make you work 110 hours a week. You know, they, the actions of the company are sometimes in contrast, stark, ugly contrast to what the well-being program is trying to knock out. And this uh, writer for HR executive is uh, basically pointing out that that's basically just uh, well-being washing. And it's kind of like when companies do greenwashing and claim that they are a much more socially responsible or environmentally responsible company than what they actually are. Um, it's It bothers me to see stories like this because I hear from people uh, all the time, hi, Greg, good point, um, uh, that particularly in the accounting profession that are just getting waylaid with all kinds of fire drills and overtime. And it's not negotiable. They either do put all this time in or they don't have a job. And how can a company in one side of its mouth talk about all the great things they're doing with their workforce and building a great employment and, and you know, culture and brand, and then turn around and do this, do those other kind of things. Um, anyway, and now we have a name for it, John. For the audio version, Greg Robinette says well-being washing seems a lot like traditional gaslighting. You know, it's it's an interesting concept as far as, yeah, sorry about your 80-hour work week, but you can still do some well-being on your own time, you know. Um, <laughs> or, or the classic is, yes, we allow you to have unlimited vacation. You just have to, uh, it, it's just the challenge will be to ever find any free time to schedule it, you know. So, you know, wh what good is that? Well, and I think this is a little bit of a side note, and I, I promised I promised already not to derail the conversation with too much AI talk, but there, I think there is this element with AI where while it's not replacing jobs, the specter of automation and AI is also keeping a lot of information worker slash white collar workers on their toes as far as, yep, I better bear down. Cause I, you know, f I feel like there's something breathing down on me. So I got to outperform and suddenly you wind up with the phenomenon of well-being washing and you don't feel so good. So let's go to the if, last one. If anyone's <laughs> been trying to comment, by the way, I think might have fixed the problem. So feel free to chime in and I'd like to test that. So please make your voice heard. I think it's working for Greg though, because Greg is well being drinking, coming to a company near you. Well, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Greg, I think it's the reverse, right? It's the, that's how a lot of people cope with service industry work is through various kinds of uh, prescription and alcoholic substances, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's the result of well-being washing as well. Brian, your next story is... This one's called Wheeler Dealer, and you can see how deal uh, is spelled. Uh, I've done a lot, interesting enough, of um, payroll and HR software selections in the last couple of years. A disproportionate amount of the projects I've been working on have been in this area, and Deal, D-E-E-L, is one of the companies that has popped up numerous times in those uh, selections with clients. Uh, Deal has competitors like uh, the one I'm the most uh, intimately familiar with is uh, Papaya Global. And they help companies set up and establish uh, workforces and operations in different countries around the world. It's a great service. And it's also a tough thing for companies to do. It's one of the reasons why a lot of firms don't expand 
uh, very rapidly overseas because it'll cost them 15 to 25 million to set up an operation. And one of the biggest problems is getting bank accounts, corporate registrations, and hiring people and getting them classified correctly in those different countries. This is an article out of, I believe it's Forbes magazine. Is that right? Um, I've got it right here. Um, uh, yeah, out of Forbes. And it's talking about deal. And the gist of the story is that Deal may have taken some shortcuts on how it, you know, uh, either got employees classified that it hired on behalf of its customers or clients or other kinds of issues. And do you grow at all cost uh, and deal with the consequences later? That's the old uh, act first, I'll apologize later uh, style of business. And I've certainly seen that in some tech companies. Or do you go the other way, which is, you know, do it right the first time, and then you don't ever attract a whole lot of regulatory kind of oversight. The story also has parallels to kind of the way Uber rolled out around the world, where they often were way ahead of regulators and legislation and laws and just started pushing out their deal, then de dealing with some of this stuff retroactively. Uh, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to take a position about who's right or wrong here. I will tell you that um, uh, I know both them and uh, Papaya and uh, Papaya I know a whole lot more closely. In fact, I think I was the first person to ever interview them for an article that might have been for ZDNet years ago. And uh, I know they do things very much by the book. Uh, but it's an interesting story for the listeners because it 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 highlights the kind of challenges a company can have if it's trying to play fast and loose with things in the in the name of expediency and gets uh, may get in trouble with regulators as a result. Cool. Well, I want to get Meg on here in a sec, so let me just blast through my picks real quick. Uh, I've got one from Laura Cicero on... Uh, what is supply chain decision support? Are we re rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic? A typical subtle post from Laura. The main reason I called Laura out is uh, anyone who's not tracking Laura who's remotely interested in supply chain, you got to track that that blog. Uh, I think she's had one of the strongest years of any enterprise blogger, uh, including people on this call. That's, that's how good she has been. Um, and she... I can't read the whole post here, but she says at one point um, da -da 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 -da. the lack of interoperability between decision support platforms is a problem. When we speak of AI, basically few question why we can't drive end-to-end -end signal. As a result, current deployments are analogous to rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. So how does that feel when you're about to start an AI project? But I think she's worth listening to. The The retail post is really about this digital dichotomy and basically this concept that I think is across a lot of industries right now, which is we want, we, we are under a lot of economic pressure and margins, but we also need to somehow do cool shit. <laughs> so we have to do both. It's an interesting concept and I think it's pretty relevant. And then finally, United Health uses faulty AI to deny elderly patients. This is an alleged lawsuit, so this is not necessarily the real deal yet, but the point is that with all the Armageddon talk about AI that's been hit the wires lately thanks to OpenAI's meltdown, there's just way too little attention being paid to systems that are live in production like this, and so much of the problem is the overreach of using AI beyond what it's good for, so that's just another pick along those lines. And now we have... Our guest Aww. tomorrow. Hello. <laughs> Look, Brian made slides for you. What do you think? <laughs> I haven't had a bear image in a long time that was, uh, and certainly never one that was uh, quite this cute. So thank you guys. <laughs> I hope that doesn't bring back bad memories of elementary school or something. No, my the bear name came through marriage, so I'm fortunate to have never made it through middle school um, with uh, with bear. So. Well, Meg, I welcome. Thank you. When I saw that on eBay, I I thought, you know, I got to use that. Uh, anyway. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I uh, good to highly see you, endorse Meg. it. Marine, the overreach of AI beyond what it's good for. Amen. Marine stayed up late 
and I know it's not for Brian and I, so Meg, this one's for you. You got fans. Thanks, Maureen, for blowing off your bedtime. Meg, welcome. We're glad to have you. I am delighted to be here. Cool. It's exciting to uh, have conversations when I'm sabbaticaling. It's uh, it's a really fun uh, moment to spend time with you guys. So thank you for including me in your wrap-up. No doubt. No doubt. Well, we're hoping that you're going to bring some some strong takes. And we actually have your your picks as well. Brian, yeah. made, a, Brian made us a slide for you about that too. Oh, so well, thank you. you I was check this out. These are your top stories. So you want to tell us why you picked them? Yeah. So, um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's leave out the obvious bits and uh, let's first talk about the one on the right, which has to do with LinkedIn just published a gender gap for green jobs. And their point, which is an important one, is that that gender gap is widening, not shrinking. But as you dig into it, and I think Cindy Gallup's core point is that there's really two pieces underneath that that I think are really important for us to be talking about. Number one is the known reality that women tend to underrepresent their capabilities and men t- tend to overrepresent their capabilities. So um, having a conversation about skills without having a conversation about how we assess and value and understand skills becomes really material. And this is a place that I think really highlights it because where new opportunities are coming, where new um, power structures are going to be created and where uh, new jobs are going to be created, we're seeing that we're falling into the same traps of making sure that those voices are overrepresented um, only by men and maybe missing out on other voices, which then gets us to the really fun topic that we all enjoyed watching was the entire uh, made-for-TV docudrama uh, experience with OpenAI and their leadership. And um, uh, I don't even know if, what you want to call it, three CEOs in uh, 36 hours or something. Um, and uh, then the ultimate outcome, which was a creation of a new board with no women and the follow on um, articles of which women should be considered for which those lists included men, um, people reporting on qualified women in AI and having that content be repurposed um, without their uh, without their consent and so on and so on. So we're seeing a lot of what I would say really troubling signals as it relates to new things emerging. And I want to remind everyone here that this is not just a case of people being intentionally um, screening people out or any of that. This is a manifestation of the reality that it's easier to recognize potential when it looks like you. And so if you have a position and you have a certain set of experiences, you're more likely to see that potential as looking and behaving and having the same background as yourself. And now is a time for us to say, does that really serve the broader needs of the world and the broader needs of technology? So I will pause and let you two uh, gentlemen reflect and share your thoughts on that. Well, I was, I I can't say I was at all surprised by that, and and I and I think, you know, of course now there's this whole rush to, tr- and of course there will be women I think appointed on this board at some point, but it's a truly bad look because one thing it tells me is that OpenEye is a big tech company, and particular in big tech we have a serious gender problem, and it it's when you see these pieces like in Wired talking about how prominent women in tech say they don't even want to join the the board it just really t- gives you a flavor right like so so um tim uh what's her name timnick gebru i probably butchered her last name she she wrote a couple really outstanding 
informative pieces of, of AI work. She co-wrote the infamous important start stochastic parrot article. She did another really important one on biases and facial recognition. And the fact that she said like she'd rather go back to Google, which fired her, than jo join OpenAI just looks so terrible for this company, which has just been totally exposed as just another big tech wannabe company. Like the whole ethics nonprofit charade has just been totally exposed. But, but Meg, I think the real concerning thing for me is that with AI on every different level, it's, it's a really concerning problem because the, the, the bias in these data sets reflects obviously the biases in society and like the, the lack of diversity from the data to the teams that are, that, that are building these algorithms all the way on up to the leadership. It, Garbage in, garbage out. I mean, what do you want? More of the same? You want more junk? I mean, to me, this is like a really disturbing story. The only optimistic part I can say is that we are at a crossroads where maybe we can like take this opportunity to have a gut check and say, at least in the enterprise context that three of us have worked in, maybe we can maybe we can learn from these mistakes and not duplicate these like disgusting big tech bro antics that just are ruining AI as far as I can tell. Um Sorry, was that balanced yeah, I, and fair? <laughs> I I really think it's a, like the the good news is we're having this conversation, and we could say that in the past this same same criteria has happened in the past multiple times, and we haven't had the conversation. So I really do see this as a moment of you know a bright light, if you will. But I also do believe deeply that. If you truly believe that there is a tipping point with AI, and I do, and if you do believe that there's going to be um, a whole series of over, uh, you know, over accomplishments, over reactions, over corrections against that, and I do, then it just suggests that now is the moment to make sure that we have enough voices. So your garbage in, garbage out is is very key. It's not it's not to, to to take away from the voices of men. It is to recognize we're missing additional voices as well. If I could just add real quick to uh, one of my my favorite books on this topic, it's called Hidden in White Sight: How AI Empowers and Deep Deepens Systemic Racism. And I'm particularly impressed by the author. Calvin Lawrence, who has a pretty significant role at IBM, yet he wrote this very outspoken book. And and one of the best things about his book is he talks about his own accountability being a part of these teams and seeing certain projects really go wrong and, and reinforce the wrong kinds of biases and stereotypes. And then he also contrasts it with some projects that really went well. And I just, I really admire that because I think one of the big themes is like, how can we have stronger voices on these topics, even if we work for employers that in stereotypically you might not think would allow that? It's like, let's step out and let's do this. And I think he's a great role model for that. And I'd like to see more, more of that and encourage that kind of discussion. Anyhow, what do you think, Brian? Um, I had a call the other day uh, with someone that I've worked with uh, several times in my career and uh, she just on her own volunteered how uh, I was really good about finding the absolute furthest point I could push somebody in their job, their career, and get them to deliver great stuff. And I tell you that because I look at people as far as what their potential is and what they can do. And I don't look at things like gender, race, and all that kind of stuff. And what's interesting is I've promoted and or caused to be promoted all kinds of, of uh, folks. And it just never crosses my mind to ever behave badly. And, and yet I know we all have built-in biases. I get it. But uh, I know I'm wired a little differently than other folks uh, because I've had to defend questions from uh, others you're like well, why do you want to promote so and so why do you want so this this person to replace you and the fact that it wasn't what others would have thought or was going to be the standard kind of uh, answer the stock answer for who to move into the spot uh was because i knew i knew that they were going to be able to just kill it in that position whoever that person was but to that end I think Meg knows this, but I actually recommended her for a CEO job uh, in, in the last few weeks. I, I don't have a problem. I've never had an issue with this. Of course, I grew up with 
tons and tons of like sisters, aunts and so forth. I, I've been all around and women don't, that doesn't trigger any reaction for me. What does bug me is ageism uh, right now. And I think everyone is going to have a little bit different kind of lens on how they look at these things. I did want to react though to the first story that Meg talked about, the one that's on the right side of the screen. And, um, that this was about whether different genders either hype up or downplay the skills that they possess. And at one level, I would say that, um, and this is a terrible generalization, but yeah, I know a bunch of braggart kind of guys who will, you know, who talk up everything, you know, as if they are the greatest person on the planet earth. And yet also know that there's some great women out there who are juggling five things at once, uh, whether it's careers and jobs and kids and education, whatever, and they don't make any noise about it. Okay, I know that kind of goes on, uh, but I would hope that AI tools would be able to infer skills and bring uh, a more balanced kind of approach and way that we look at people. But then maybe counting on something that may or may not happen from AI anytime soon. I know that's been the promise of some vendors out there. So um, I think them- that's exactly the point is the mm. how do we lean on this opportunity to recognize the right adjacencies? If you spend more time with that green gender gap report from LinkedIn, you you recognize that what they're saying is is they they've right they've defined adjacencies to these green jobs and the way they've defined adjacencies have been more um, male leaning, which means that they might be missing some very important adjacencies right? because of, again, a blind spot. And so the question isn't just about how do we tip the scales? The question really comes to, if we know, and we do, that we're going to need to develop new skills to meet the challenges of the future. And if we know that developing those new skills is going to have to happen faster than it's ever happened before, then it's, it's in all of our best interest to find those patterns that help us find those adjacencies. And in order to find those patterns, AI can help us, but it'll only help us if we start asking the harder questions. What are we missing? Who right. are we missing? Which voices and experiences are we overlooking? And not because we're we're misintentioned, but because we don't see them, because we haven't lived them, we haven't experienced them, we might not even know about those other paths. So that's yeah, can, why it's important. I yeah. Think. And I'd like to bring up an example of that because I was talking to a vendor recently about their skills ontology. And I'm a pretty big fan of of the potential of moving from kind of rules-based engines, which I think are, can really screen out people in crappy ways versus skills ontologies where you can really help people like think about their talent in a career a different way. But to your point, I said, well, what, what about the soft skills on these ontologies, right? Like like the vast majority of the skills you've documented. And, and that's really important because all the AI tools, all the talent recommendations are all going to be based on that core data. And I couldn't help but notice that a lot of the so-called soft skills missing from the ontology were skills you might stereotypically associate with 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 women. And, and I mean that in the best way possible because I've worked a lot in my career to try to emulate female leaders who I thought exhibited those skills. So I mean that in a good way, but I was like, where are those skills? And they're like, well, we're going to work on adding those. I'm like, well, if they're not in there, then again, we, we got a problem. And so I don't know, Meg, you can fix this. I know you can fix it. So. <laughs> well, I do. I do really, really feel that this is an important tipping point, which is why I'm so pleased we're having this conversation because I really believe that this, this moment, you know, forget singularity, forget like AI taking over the world this moment and like your other stories that say like there is real things happening today that are using algorithms to help make decisions. And those algorithms, we all know, have the opportunity to get better and they have an opportunity to get better quickly. And if we use this moment to define what getting better means and what getting better looks like, we have an opportunity to make that a much more uh, inclusive situation for everyone. 
we're not going to turn all of us into wonderful people if we're not, and we're not going to like remove racism and, and bias, et cetera. But what we can do, what we absolutely should do is to better equip people like yourselves who are wanting to create opportunities for all, but maybe don't have the visibility or the understanding or the data to, to support that in a more holistic way. And we can so, see very clearly we're missing something. So we should use this as a chance to fix it. So let's take this a step further, Meg. Uh, it's clear to me that we need a different kind of manager, or leader, or executive, whatever, in a lot of business today. We need someone who clearly has a better empathetic kind of approach to how they drive and motivate people and get them to do great work. The problem is that's not where those skills around empathy, they're not, to John's point about not only those soft, but they don't show up on, you know, and on and a lot of uh, whatever performance reviews, whatever, um, they tend to get passed over or nowhere near the documentation. So the AI tools are not, they're replicating the past. What, you know, uh, where we were, Bingo. where we were rewarded managers who like uh, steamrolled over people, uh, didn't respect their, you know, their their personal needs from time to time. Like, I got to go home and take care of a sick kid. You know, it's something that basic. They just don't do it, and there was nothing that punished them, if you will, for having those, for exhibiting those non-empathetic behaviors. I I worry that the AI tools will simply replicate the bad managerial practices of the past. And th this is beyond higher influence hiring because if those factors don't show up, if they're not recorded, they can't get trained into models and they're not going to change the outcomes that people are expecting out of these tools. Which is exactly the point. And I, I really do believe that the other thing in one of your uh, prior discussions it really comes to what happens on the ground. You can have all the best HR programs. You can have your well-being programs. You can have your unlimited vacation programs or whatever. But it all falls apart if the people responsible for delivering on the business are not um, trained and qualified and equipped to really think differently about what their responsibility is to culture, what their responsibility is to talent mobility, what their responsibility is to learning, to creating um, in cultures and environments where people can adapt to the needs of the future. And so if you really want to kind of like dig to that next level, what we have is an opportunity here to not only think about how the algorithms change, but how do the structures of work change and how does the role of a manager, of a leader um, require different skills? And I would argue, as you are saying, I would put a little bit stronger point on it. I don't think you can be a leader in, in the needs of today in an, in an industry that has real pressure, whether it's macro pressure or um, technology pressure or all of the above. I don't think you can be a leader today and not have your own learning agility requirements and not have your own empathy and team development and culture development expectations of the role. Because without that, you are not going to be personally equipped to be successful because it requires a lot more skill and a lot more human skill um, than probably existed in the past. And I Indeed. think that's the reality. So let me put through a few comments here. Brent, Le Brent Leary just wants to agree that you can fix these problems. Uh, um, love that's you, Brent. <laughs> thanks, Brent. And and by the way, congratulations. You win the Marathon Live Stream Award. You actually streamed uh, CRM players, and now you're here. So you get the door prize by a wide margin. Marine hopes it's a tipping point, but I guess we will find out. And Greg says that we may amplify those mistakes of the past if AI algorithms become wholly self-feeding. And <clears throat> again, Greg, this comes back to some of the points that I've been making, and I've been doing deep dives on this for about nine months now, is that how these systems are divine, designed to have a big impact. Because if you're not aware of that, then you can't counterbalance those systems with new data structures and new information. And, and, and Meg, I think if you, to your point around people, if you don't 
if you don't present them with forward thinking tools that reframe their thinking, then it's just going to reinforce their past prejudices. So with that in mind, I want to ask you, if you're on sabbatical now, but assume you're back in a in a leading role uh, in, in the future in 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 an HR context, what are you going to say to customers around like these HR leaders in particular that are trying to balance the pressures around talent, hiring, uh, sourcing, talent sourcing, all that stuff versus the pressure to take advantage of these so-called AI, AI tools, even if sometimes they're having harmful effects on discriminatory practices and stuff like what is going to be your advice on how to make this mix work to capture that more hopeful side of your your view there? Yeah, so I've definitely been thinking about this uh, quite a bit. So in, you know, in the past, and I, I would say maybe up through 2010 or a little bit beyond, we had a lot of discussion about HR leaders getting closer to the business, understanding the business more, being part of the uh, the business. And I, and I still believe that deeply. Um, I think that now we're in a moment where the conversation needs to shift and, and the business needs to have more connection and and um, awareness and learning from the HR function. And this is actually an interesting um, dichotomy because of course, the business doesn't isn't directly motivated to think that this is the problem that they need to think about. So we really need to spend some time to figure out how to get this to be um, more adaptable and absorbable and a consumable by a business leader. But to be an effective business leader in this kind of time where there's so many new things coming at you, you really need guidance and help at a much deeper level than you probably ever needed before. And so you don't just need your HR leader to help you bring new people on board and you don't just need them to help you stay in compliance. You still need those things, but those are not the only things you need. You need them to be your partner in culture transformation, to be your partner in skills development and learning development for your team so that you can concretely succeed. And this is going to cause a fair bit of discomfort because none of us like to be really senior leaders and be faced with the reality that we might not have the skills we need to be as successful as we think we ought to be. So, you know, Adam Grant calls this unlearning, and I do believe there's a fair bit of humility and unlearning and, and you know, development that needs to happen. But I think this is an opportunity when, when we figure out how to make this really well understood. It's an opportunity for the business to be asking more from HR leaders mm. and different things from HR leaders, not just go figure out a learning and development thing or go figure out you know, how we're going to get more talent pipeline, but help us with job transformation, help us with, you know, internal talent mobility, help us with creating seed teams that can try things out and, and come back with recommendations on how we should transform our business, our teams, our organizations, and our people. So let me, I'd like to react on that. Uh, I think, um, <laughs> I think part of the problem in a lot of companies, the, the reason they don't win the war for talent, and to me, that ought to be like the first question that the CHRO is asking the executive team, why aren't we winning it? And so when you talk about, oh, yeah, we want to have, uh, whether it's uh, we, we're rolling out a wellness program or we want to have a, a particular kind of employment brand that is highly attractive to people uh, or any number of other initiatives, the real problem, believe it or not, is usually it's the other executives at the executive table. They're the ones who don't take any continuing education, or if they do, it's like CPE credit for the controller or the CFO. And all that's focused in on if they get to it in a timely fashion is on some tax you know, pronouncement or whatever. It has nothing to do with really changing their attitudes and their thinking around manage your management practices. I know a lot of the management courses uh, I took in uh, grad school back, you know, eons ago, um, some of those things have all been completely debunked. And yet uh, I know I went through generations have gone through being trained on all the wrong stuff, if you will. So if we're going to create, um, you know, we should be, the, the chief HR officer should be tasking the executive committee on 
what are you going to do, each of you individually, to create an environment where people want to work at your company years longer than they otherwise would have? And that will require them to think about, oh, man, we got to quit doing fire drills. We need to actually adequately staff a given position instead of making people work outrageous amounts of overtime, particularly the unpaid overtime. That almost ought to be criminal. I mean, there's a whole like the there's there's the stated way of running a business, and then there's the understated way to really drive a business into the ground. And there are some executives <laughs> who are really good at doing the, the latter. So. I feel for the chief HR officer, but they're going to have to have this, these frank come to Jesus kind of conversations if they're ever going to get some fundamental change done, because the chief HR officer didn't necessarily make the problem or make the situation, but it's the other executives who took that and made it much worse than it needs to be. If you can fix that, Meg, you can retire. Um, You know it. Well, Jim Collins called it level five leadership, and I think that it is time to ask for CHROs to be able to hold business leaders accountable to that level of standard. Well, okay, we got we got to bring Maureen in here for a sec. Meg, I'll have you respond to this one because uh, I know Meg, you have to leave in just a couple minutes. So I want to make the most of your remaining time. Maureen says, "I love hearing all this, but I see so few companies prioritizing any of it. Proper AI, proper HR." Real quick, John, to Maureen, yet. If I had talked to software vendors, they think everything is just coming up roses all over the place. And mm-hmm. I always feel like this crusty old curmudgeon going, no, that is not what I'm seeing out at, at uh, clients. And uh, I mean, they're just, they're basket cases all over the place. But anyway, sorry, John, I interrupted you. No worries. So Meg, you can reconcile that for us, please. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, of course, this is not uh, happening today. But I do believe that we have to start talking about it now to make it happen. Meg, do you have AI fatigue? Oh, you betcha. You betcha. I definitely have AI fatigue for uh, what I just read a great quote, semi-informed information about AI. I just, uh, a lot of people just holding up air because they want to uh, be part of the conversation. That's what my fatigue is about more than anything. And Brian picked a nice picture for you for something that inspires or creates value. How how do you find inspiration amidst all of this? You know, I find inspiration, honestly, because of the fact that we are creating a space to have conversations. I think Brian's point, we're having conversations about age. We're having conversations about bias. We're having conversations about uncomfortable topics. And to me, I think that is so important because once we start having these conversations, we can commit to fix it. And I really do believe that that's where we need to go. I mean, I I just don't think we can pretend that everything is fine anymore. Can I also just say too, that I think, I think I I appreciate your willingness to have like a pretty frank conversation about this because actually like difficult conversations, which I think makes other people uncomfortable sometimes. But uh, but I also think, and, and you posted this on LinkedIn just, I think, yesterday maybe, that humor has a role to play in this too. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about this in the context of like my pink flamingo here, which some people tease me about. But earlier today, I was spending time cutting a, a hat, a holiday hat for the broadcast. So, you know, I th- I think a little bit of of ability to laugh at one's predicaments is is going to be part of the mix here. And I, I wish we had a little more of that in the enterprise because I think we sorely need it. But anyway. And I do think you guys are holding up a really big flag with your unpredictions and uh, <laughs> your ability to, uh, to kind of call it as it is. So I do have one ad before we run out of time. Oh, do I you have, have an un- un- prediction up- of your own? Yeah, yes, I I don't have it Whoa. fully written up, so I will leave this to you, Brian, to help with the uh, with the crafting. But I do believe we do have a new Decacorn opportunity with mansplaining as a service. Um, it's really an untapped mm. gap, and um, I think that there's uh, there's plenty of art and uh, people that would be willing to uh, step into that gap. So. Oh my gosh! Yeah. 
<laughs> I, I see I see a start an ironical startup opportunity. Yes. Well, Indeed. thank you, thank you for your leadership and pointing. That yes, out. all the no leadership. Doubt. Yes, <laughs> uh, atomic leadership for. Oh for yeah, leadership. the atomic. Leaders. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. How, does that spell mass? M A A S. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. That's interesting. Awkward. Yeah. There's, that's there's got lots potential. You can do with it. Yeah. Well, we open AI saga may be over, but where will Meg Bear land? Will will be a good saga for next next yeah, year. We, so we look hope, forward to track we hope that. to know what that might be at the end of the 2024, but hopefully not too soon. So I'm enjoying the nowhere. <laughs> well, we're sure looking forward to it. And and thanks for keeping the bar high for, for HR. Now, I know you have to regroup for, for your next thing. So you are hereby dismissed. Much love. But Thank we're you, so everyone. glad to have you. Thanks, Meg. And just remember, Meg, Ladies. you can't spell pain without the letters AI. Anyway, uh, we'll talk soon. Bye bye. Mass, yeah, Brent. Brent likes the the mass concept. He he thinks that's got a lot of potential. <laughs> Mansplaining is <laughs> a service. He yeah, likes that. to help Meg know what mass is. Ouch. Oh, oh man, oh, man. Greg, that is cold hearted. <laughs> that that is. <laughs> That is brooded, absolutely brutal. Absolutely you know, we, brutal. We could probably do a whole dedicated podcast on coming up with uh, acronyms and buzzwords for next year's, uh, uh, you know, uh, excuse me, uh, unprediction steal. Uh, judging by that, I want to get I want to get back to Marine's comments. I think this is pretty important. You know, there there's this thing around like, like, what do you make of this this thing, Brian? Because I have a slightly different take on it than Marine because like the way I kind of look at this is that like I figured out a long time ago that the enterprise wasn't going to like adopt all of my ridiculous extreme ideas uh, like like the idea that marketers need to become journalists and salespeople need to become advisors and things like that. But but the whole thing is uh, <laughs> that the, that I think that that inside of organizations there are are pockets of change and pockets of transformation and there's people that get it. And then some organizations develop momentum for a time, but then of course, a lot of times they get waylaid by mergers and acquisitions and various leadership shuffles or they get acquired by someone, or you get a company that has a lot of momentum for change, like target doing really well. And then they hit other roadblocks that slow them down. I don't know. I mean, to me, like, there there are few companies that are truly on this path, but I also think that it's really important to try to be a resource for those that are trying to make change and that there are a fair amount that are trying. It's just really tough. I, what is your take on it? Well, there's two parts to that. Uh, Maureen's talking to some extent about AI, and then the rest is about all this change. And um, on the AI side... I'm always a bit chagrined when new technology comes out. Uh, yes, you're going to have the uh, the curious people, the hobbyists, whatever, who are going to be, or, or the highly innovative uh, folks who are going to be the first one to try something out. And they'll make some mistakes, and they'll make some course corrections, and they'll be okay. But unfortunately, there's a big pile of people that look at a new technology like AI, and they don't ever ask the question, should we? They the question for them is, hey, now we can do something. And just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you should. There, there is a there is this can I can I get to my whiff for that? Okay, go for it. Because I think the whiff is right there, right? Yeah. That's exactly what you're talking about. Sports Illustrated found publishing AI generated stories, which of course they totally denied. But then researchers like documented there were all these like names of AI generated bios of people that had done bylines that, that didn't even exist. Right. So okay. again, it's like, it's a total overreach, right. Of this notion of like, yeah, let's, you know, and, and this whole thing around like this declining once proud media publication, trying to squeeze what remains of the asset through very cynical behavior. And, and I just find it really troubling and hard to believe that anyone thought they could get away with publishing that kind of puke, and, and, and getting away with it. But it's just really like, to your point, like just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Right. And, and it's just not going to work. 
And there, the other problem is short-termism. There's a bunch of people that think that if I could do this in the short term, they have no concept of long term. They don't understand that if any of this goes south, it's going to have a horrible uh, destructive impact on the brand or the value of the company or even the longevity of the company all the way around. Uh, so, yeah, that um, – I, I, and – I learned a valuable lesson. A buddy of mine is a famous Wall Street analyst, and he instructed me one day about like, he goes, you know, Brian, the difference between you and I is for me, short term is the close of trading today at three o'clock. Uh, long term is uh, when the financials come out at the end of the month. And I'm more like short term is within this year. Long term is like three to five years out. And then there are some other people that, you know, think short term is five years from now, long term is 50 or something. And we, we we have a bunch of people that look at these new technologies with no concept of time or what the long tail kind of effects are going to be when they embrace this. And they and yet they go ahead and rush out and deploy it for an entire enterprise when they ought to be running careful experiments to make sure they really, truly understand what they're about to unleash. I mean, this stuff, it's got the Kraken written, written all over it in some regards. So, uh, you know, Caveat emptor, folks. If you go for it, what was uh, was that? Oh, by the, had by a, the way, no. by the way, Brent Brent thought I said um, murders and acquisitions, which <laughs> <laughs> which you know, ironically, he is, might have yeah, you know. <laughs> is kind of accurate in a way. Um, yeah, Ma Marine is um, Marine. You were in such a good mood earlier when you posted that picture of you and Dion having a really great conversation. I don't know. We got to like get you out on the town again and cheer you up a little bit, but I totally feel you. I get it. The change agent makes some progress and the culture always creeps back in and weaves its depressing web over the change agent. Always, always. <laughs> oh man. I don't well, know, Marine. I'm not, I'm not going to give up. I'm you're trying to get me to give up. It's not going to work. I'm, I'm completely screwed. I'm stuck. You're stuck with me and we're stuck with you. So we're just going to have to keep pressing on. What a positive thought, though. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the best motivational speech I can give on on a Thursday evening. But so we've run our slides. Is that right, John? Uh, yeah, I think we pretty much have. We pretty much okay. have have, well, have done it. Yep. Uh, I always live in mortal fear that we've got like three times more slides than we have the available time. So this worked out well from a timing perspective. Um, Marine's not giving up. She wants to get the C-suite on board. So, all right, Marine, I, I, I would never expect you to give up or give in. So I never, never I, stop. I actually, I, not only do I agree with that, I would tell you that um, I run into Marine. I hit a bunch of uh, chief HR officers who, uh, they use me. They they want me to help them go push the executive committee out of whatever comfortable space they're in. Uh, one of the toughest things I think out there in changing executive teams is that they are so wrapped up around nostalgia. They don't even realize it. And I always have to tell them that nostalgia is not a strategy. I don't really care. Uh that, you know, that's the way they always did it or whatever, it's time to change. And as uncomfortable as that is for a lot of folks to realize that, um, it's why I got, why clients pay me. They pay me to push them out of their comfort zone. And I hope you get a chance to push the living daylights out of some other companies and their executive teams as well, uh, because that's the only way we're going to see some progress made. No doubt. No doubt. Them, them's fighting words. So we're gonna we're gonna wrap up fairly soon, but um, want to thank those of you who joined us on a special date and time. I hope I hope Meg and the overall show lived up to your goals. I love this AI fatigue slide, it, Brian. It's kind of bringing back some memories from the event circuit. Oh uh, yeah, that was that was one gnarly hotel I had to stay in in Vegas on one one of my umpteen trips there this fall, and. Uh, but yeah, uh, th just the room made you feel tired. Uh, but anyway, um, Greg says change agents get pushed back, but usually gain traction, even though it's not always perceptible. There's progress in some places, and sometimes that is enough for today. Um, all I know is that, like, if I was the only one that thought this way, then I would probably have left this business a long time ago. But fortunately, form alliances 
and you try to make as many evil plans as possible. In fact, I remember, if I if I may share a brief anecdote, many, many years ago, Brian and I were at a briefing together. It was about six people in the room, something like that. And it was on a really exciting topic, GRC, which is kind of fallen out of favor, governance risk compliance as, as an acronym. And, um, and Brian, you were doing what I call your, um, steam kettle routine where I could tell, oh, like, oh. <laughs> I could tell you oh. getting more, more and more frustrated with the vendor briefing, like, but you had, but you were real quiet, but I was really, really worried about the vendor spokesperson. Cause like, I was like, Brian's like heating up and the vendor person doesn't realize it yet, but you're, you're about to go off. Like the kettle goes when it like blow finally blows. Mm-hmm. And then you, and then you, and then you blew your top. And I remember the phrase you said, what we have here is a study in incrementalism, which was beautiful. Yep. And that, that was about like 45 <laughs> minutes into this poor soul spiel. And, um, and I well, it was, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah but anyway, uh, we were down with GRC. Hey, Brent, if you're in the enterprise, you gotta be able to talk about risk and compliance, man. It's just a way of life, man. But, uh, but um no so so i remember thinking at that point like you know i gotta try to collaborate more with with this guy and hey it ended up happening and and this is one of our latest experiments and appreciate y'all coming along for a completely uncensored unsponsored broadcast that no vendor will touch with a 10-foot pole but hopefully you guys (laughs) feel like these conversations are worthwhile but anyway uh, that that's kind of my answer to Marine's uh, thing, uh, that sort of despairing uh, thing around changing. I don't know. I, change the outcome is always uncertain, but forming alliances with people that you respect and and like like love working with. I mean, to me, that's the gold. So that's my inspirational holiday message for y'all. Um, the hat came off. There we go. Well. Uh, I- uh, for the, the listeners, I have, um, there's, it, it's kind of a small club, the analyst world, and uh, there are not really that many of us, and we see each other all the time. There are some months in the fall, I see more of Holger Mueller than I see of my own wife, uh, you know, and, you know, write your own headline or punchline for that. Alex. Uh, but um, to say we all kind of know each other and we know the... Um, uh, and, you know, and we've gotten to know a lot of whatever the quirks and idiosyncrasies are. But what John describes is right about, yeah, I I can, I only have a tolerance level for just inept bullshit or uh, or somebody trying to pass off some really stale old concept as it as if it was the greatest news that has hit the wire service today uh in fact somebody uh one of the major eight uh electronic companies was proudly announcing just a month ago that 2023 is the year of the cloud and i'm like really and you know um for does it so, well yeah that it's enterprise that's... snark yeah um not, Thank you, not the a little bit of an awkward acronym, but we could run with that. S SNAS. Yeah, absolutely. No, no problem, Greg. Thanks for thanks for your intuitive approach to the same topic. Brent, Brent bullshit. hates bullshit, but he <laughs> detests the inept bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do we yeah. how do we get through how do we get through, Brent? I'm not sure. But uh by the way, uh for for those of you who haven't gotten enough uh video experiences i'm on disrupt tv on friday i'm gonna really try to crash ray and vala's um happy times with my grouchy uh demeanor and then on on next week i'm on esteban sh- show which is part of brent's players production network so um i wonder if esteban's gonna want to have a big fight with me about ai again i hope not i'd rather talk about something else but anyhow, oh, and we got to answer this question about next year, the new, the new season. Yeah. Yeah. Look, Brian, when's our spring season going to start? I think we'll probably start sometime like mid-January because we got some travel coming up later in January, I think. So. Yeah, that sounds like a bad 70s uh, action TV show. 
stay tuned for the bro hammer and the cowboy <laughs> you know I'm like oh yeah God. i uh, i don't think you or i came up with those names that's all a brent leary special there uh, maybe, you know maybe we should just do reruns i remember when nbc did reruns for like a whole season and they were like it's new to you was like so we'll just do like a whole it's new to you series of our favorite shows but no we probably will start like mid-january before things get crazy because it looks like travel's going to be nuts this spring again so anyway i think we're well, at diminishing know. we're at diminishing returns brian yeah and uh i'm very happy to be back on in january uh if you want to do something then cool uh, because i'm already starting to see the uh some of the analyst calendars starting to pack up on uh yeah. somewhere in january already with some really quality trips coming up oh you know um can't wait to crawl into those Embraer 175s man you know that's that's what i live for um no comment no comment oh i i should say that brent gave you a hard time about your slides too well actually he said he was he was amazed i think that the slideshow finally finished but um man you got you got nothing on vendor slides man i remember um celebrating a vendor on twitter with when the, once they passed 50 slides in a, in an hour <laughs> that wasn't received with the most humor internally but i thought it was pretty impressive to get through 50 powerpoint slides in an hour but anyhow, we only have like 10 slides, so. Tell you what, you would be hard-pressed to ever find me ever overrun a time slot. I I, I, I have my yeah. pacing and everything down. Speaking of which, let's, let's not overrun ours. Thanks, right. everyone. Have a great holiday. Appreciate you coming. Catch you next year. Later. Yeah, I, I hope uh, plenty of presents everybody gets, no matter what kind of holiday you separ- uh, celebrate. So Bye, be y'all. good, everyone. Bye-bye. Safe travels.